Thank you. Thanks, David, for the introduction. It's funny, uh, when you try to introduce me, there's so many ways to describe it. It reminded me of a couple of weeks ago when I was introduced by someone and he said, you are not an artist, you're not an architect, you're not a designer, you're not an innovator. You are a hippie with a business plan. <laughs> and, and in a way, I can really appreciate that. And in a way, that is also what the Wired community is about. Eh? People who dare to dream and at the same time have a desire to make it happen. So today, I want to talk about that. Eh? How can we sort of push creative thinking and use technology and design basically to improve life. And I want to show you some examples which have gone right, eh? which in their own way have been successful. Bicycle paths which charge at daytime and glow at night. Indeed, a smog-free tower giving clean air to heavily polluted cities like Mumbai uh, and Beijing. But before we dive into that, I thought it would be interesting to start with an example when it goes wrong. Because we, we, it's a weird, we don't really talk about it that much, but this relationship between people and technology is, of course, fragile um, and sensitive. This is an example when it goes wrong. Three years ago, in Uzbekistan, people who encountered the escalator for the first time in their lives, and um, it goes wrong. <laughs> it goes horribly wrong. And, you know, I think... This is interesting because we live in a new world. And sometimes we're a bit scared of it. Yeah? <laughs> we push a button and it stops. So we have to get used a bit to the new world we live in. <laughs> <laughs> and then I like this. Then a leader comes yeah, and he stops. He pushes a button. But this is a good leader. He's a brave leader because he waits a little bit. Look at his white little feet. And then he puts it on. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I would be doing. So in this new world, it's maybe not that difficult. What we l have to learn is to <laughs> let go. Just let go. But apparently, we find this very difficult. Yeah. By the way, I have a two-hour footage of this. Eh? So we can just sort of <laughs> skip all the project, just read Wired. And, uh, <laughs> So why am I showing you this? Well, this is us. This is you, this is me. We know that old systems are crashing in terms of economy, in terms of energy. Um, and at the same time, a lot of people, not you, eh, but a lot of other people, they're scared of this new world. Will robots take over our jobs? What does authenticity mean in this hyper-connected world? And I like that. I think we shouldn't be scared, we should be curious. And it starts, in a way, with looking. A eh? long, long time ago, when you were a boy or a girl, in, in your bedroom, looking at the ceiling, I had these light-emitting little stars. You must know what I mean, eh? Charging at daytime, glowing at night. And this is 20, 25-year-old technology, which has been around us many, many years. But at the same time, it fascinated me. How can we make light, which is energy-friendly, connected with nature? Two years ago, we started to look at this material, which actually has old poisonous radon in it, so really not good worked only for 30 minutes, we went back to the lab, made it more durable, more light emitting, and started to connect it with this, Van Gogh, eh? a famous Dutch painter. Um, International Van Gogh Foundation came to us and said, there is this place in Nune, nearby Amsterdam in Eindhoven, where he lived and worked. And a lot of people go there to experience his heritage, and, and, and to, but the problem is of this place is there's nothing to see. <laughs> Because Van Gogh, of, so, of course, sort of died, eh? and is in that way uh, useless. Uh, and the paintings are hanging in great museum with sign, please do not touch. So, so they, they asked me, can you make something to bring back this cultural heritage again? And in a way, you know, this is, yeah, I mean, this is how my brain works. Maybe that's the, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's no easier way to explain. We started to connect this. And I, I think I signed a form that I'm allowed to do this for one hour and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And this is what we made later on, a bicycle path which charges at daytime and glows at night, hinting towards a future which is energy friendly, linking local, tradi uh, local tradition. Eh? Van Gogh actually walked these grounds in 18, uh, 1883. And it's something you can go to uh, every night. No ticket needed, yeah, short move. Can we dim the lights a bit? Or just kill them? Yeah. Super.
It's just like we're laying on a starry night. Thank you. Thank you. So we launched this two years ago, and suddenly something happened that, to be honest, we didn't expect it. Some, suddenly a bicycle path became world news. And that's weird, because when we talk about mobility and innovation, there's always a focus on the car. Eh? That can be sexy and glamorous and billions of R&D, but somehow the roads, the infrastructure, almost nobody cares. And we launched this. This was the first kilometer, not so big. Two worlds started to wake up. The world of the hard capital, eh? so the sheikhs from Qatar started to call how much for 10 kilometers. Which, which was also good, but, but as, as important, the world of the soft capital. This is a children's book which was sent to us a couple of weeks ago. We didn't know anything about this. Eh? And in this book, the children visit the life of Van Gogh, and in that book, they visit the bicycle path. You see, they, they made a little copycat. Eh? So we, we sued their asses. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Okay, next slide. Anyway, so, so you dive into... Oh, yeah, very good. Maybe we should, no, no, no I'm going to tell that another story. Uh, uh, so you dive into the world of imagination uh, and you know, you have a whole new generation of children looking at bicycle paths that we find normal now and saying, hey mama, this one doesn't work. Yeah? So maybe the role of art is to, to question, to ask why, what is normal and what is not the normal. Highway and we're concern, applying this now to highways as well. Safety. And we'll debut mid next year. Glow-in-the-dark road markings use photoluminescent paint, which charges during the day and can light roads for up to 10 hours at night. The temperature-responsive road paint shows ice crystal patterns when temperatures fall below zero to warn drivers of slippery roads. Interactive lights light up when vehicles approach and dim as they pass by, saving energy when there is no traffic on the road. Wind lights get energy from roadside pinwheel generators they light up using the draft produced by passing vehicles. Induction priority lanes are layered with induction coils under the tarmac to recharge electric cars as they drive. The various technologies will be introduced in the Dutch province of Brabant starting mid-2013. So suddenly, of course, the world around us, technology jumps out of the screen and becomes part of the, of the world around us. But at the same time, these ideas, of course, they, they're not just me. It's not that I have an idea, I plug a 3D printer in my neurons, and then sort of magically hey, it all appears. Um, it's teamwork. So this is the studio in Rotterdam, an old glass factory, which we saved from demolishment and repaired, where we work with the team of designers, process managers, external experts, industry, um, the dream factory. And this is not just art in art as, oh, it's nice and intellectually yeah, responsible, something you talk about birthdays. No, 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 no. It is the new economy. World Economic Forum, the think tank in Geneva, in, interviewed a lot of famous smart people asking what are the top 10 skills you need in the future to be successful, uh, happy uh, uh, job-wise, etc. And this is not programming C++, with, with all due respect to the great programmer. And it's not about money. Look at number three, creativity. Number two, critical thinking. Number one, Problem solving, complex problem solving, all the things a robot or a computer is not really that good at yet. So I hope for a future that because of this hyper technological connected world, in a weird way, we will reappreciate these unique human skills. So we will have a renaissance of arts and science and architecture because it's something that technology will not, um, how do you say it, will not, will not be able to challenge that much. So that's going to be an interesting, hopeful world. And indeed, it starts with the question, why? Why? Or how does a jellyfish emit light or a firefly? Eh? Why do we accept pollution like this? This is Beijing from my room three years ago. The below image on a Saturday. Eh? The life is okay. I'm looking at uh, CCTV tower. This is Rem, Dutch architect. And life is okay. You see the cars, the people, the birds. Okay, it's a city. And then the top image, holy shit. <laughs> On a Wednesday, a city so polluted, you, you almost start to smoke again just to feel healthy. Yeah? That was like, like really, like, aha. Uh -huh. And this is sad. This is George Orwell, not Da Vinci. This is not the future we all share. So technology has sometimes side effects that we never imagined, and pollution is one of them. And so, of course, there's a China government investing 
billions in their war on smog, but it takes too long, eh? replacing factories and saying you should do less, but everybody wants to do more. So, so two days later, in a weird way, I became inspired by Beijing smog. Maybe that's, that's the best way to say it. And I'm, I'm the son of a math teacher, so I, I realized that when you were a boy and you're, you're, play, you're at this boring children party, eh? when you're like eight years old and you cannot go because you're, you're a child, you're, you're playing with balloons and you polish it with your hand, it becomes static. Yeah, static electrified. It starts to attract your hair. And I'm like, ah, so what if we would use that principle and literally build the largest smog vacuum cleaner in the world, which sucks up polluted air, cleans it, and then releases clean air, so we have areas which are clean again. And we built the first one in Rotterdam, sucking up 30,000 cubic meter per hour. It's like a soccer stadium per day. Capturing the small PM2.5, eh, the, the, the PM10 particles, the ultra-fine particles, via positive ionization, and then releasing the clean air so we have areas, parks, which are 75% more clean than the rest of the city. And we made it in such a way that it uses like um, 1,000 watts, like a, like a water boiler. And the next one is, of course, solar panels. Short move. Pollution. It's really weird that we accept it as something normal and take it for granted. I wanted to create a place where citizens, makers, NGOs and governments can experience clean air. A bubble of clean air, where people can think, meet and work together how to make a whole city smog free. It's a place created by the largest air purifying in the world, which can travel a smog free tower. In the future, waste should not exist. By putting the captured smog particles on the high pressure, we create smog-free rigs. And so by sharing a smog-free ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city where the smog-free tower is in. launched 12 months ago in Rotterdam. It is about the dream of clean air. But also we learn this, I think I have it, oh yeah, here. This is not the substance Amsterdam is famous for. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, Beijing smog. This is what we, here, yeah, you can show it around. Incredibly disgusting. Really, you live two years shorter because of this. Uh, living next to a highway is the same as 17 cigarettes per day without the pleasure of the nicotine. Eh? So it's like, huh. But we, we realized we, we, we have to do something with this. This is also beauty, not just technology, but connected. 42% is carbon, 48, 42. Compressing carbon under a lot of pressure, you get diamonds. Eh? Yes. So what if we would do that for 30 minutes by hand? And so by sharing a ring, here I... So by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air. Yeah, you can show it. I'm not going to propose, but you can show it there. I should always be careful with it. So, and what was fascinating is that we had a budget problem during this project because all the mayors were interested, but at the same time were like, if we support your project, then everybody will know that we're polluted. We're like, well, hello, if you live in Mumbai, Beijing, or London, you will know, but still. So we put this online, Kickstarter. And people started to pre-order it, but even more importantly, prepay it. So the finance we made with the jury helped us to realize the first tower. And people started to wear it, eh? like, uh, like here, or this guy. Who's this guy? Yeah, Prince Charles. They're wearing the cufflinks. Or here, this three weeks ago. True story. Two uh, Indian couple, and they're proposing. So she. Look, look at this, I love it. <laughs> look at the top image, yeah. So make something that people connect with. Make it personal, make it shareable. And indeed, after 14 months in, in, in struggling, fighting, negotiating, it has landed in Beijing, showing the beauty of clean air. 
You know, is one tower the solution for a whole city? No, you're right. Okay? The real solution is clean technology, electric cars, etc., etc. But I don't want to wait. And I th believe that if we make a place where people can feel the difference, where they can smell the difference, that is a sort of proactive attitude which we need to do. We're not consumers, we're makers. Yeah? And finally, I love to work in this sort of landscape notion. We're so focused on this screen, but what about the world around us? And the Netherlands is interesting because most of the Netherlands is below sea level. And so without technology, without creativity, we would literally all die. Eh? Like a horror. And, and it's interesting because we, we created this system of dikes, of windmills, of, uh, of, of technology, and we stayed. You know, we don't move to Germany, eh? though we, <laughs> we fight with nature, we, we, we work with nature. And these windmills, Kinderdijk, are a part of that, cultural heritage now. But can you imagine that 300 years ago this baby was dropped in your backyard? Eh? They look like aliens, look at the shape. And now the green energy, the windmills, a lot of people want them, but not in their backyard. So we were like, can we sort of grab this allure of Kinderdijk into the windmills of today to show the beauty of green energy? That's this. Final. De molens toch ik in een, uh, ja, een ander licht, dat de mensen een uh, beter beeld krijgen van, uh, van windenergie. Het heeft wel iets echt van, uh, van touwtjes springen, maar dan met de wind. Heel apart ja. om te zien. Ja. Imponerend, prachtig zicht zo, die lijn. Het zou een keer direct 2.0 kunnen zijn. Like a dance, like a choreography, like a, like a zen line moving in the sky. Here we almost did nothing, eh? we just drew a line. <laughs> you know, the windmills were already there and LED was invented in 1962. But walking around in the evening and, and you know, people starting to mesmerize and, and just stare at that. And, and of course the coders, eh, the, the software coders, tweaking their sensors and their calibration. Because if, if, like, if you miss the blade eh, and the, the line keeps on going, Pilot gets it in the eye, plane goes down, not good, not good. So we, it looks simple, but we really had to make layers and layers and layers of software codes to make sure that um, they all connect, because of course there's a lot of turbulence and wind. But in a weird way, maybe this is what we should be doing, realizing that, that, that everything already exists, eh? the technology, the ideas, but all we really need to do is find a new link between the beauty and the bullshit eh, which surrounds us <laughs> between the poetry and the pragmatism, between the, the dream and the business plan. And I think if we start doing that, even more than we're doing right now, um, there's a whole new world to be explored. And I'm looking forward to have a conversation with you to drag that kind of thinking even more uh, within the now. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah.